All right, everyone. Um, you know, when it rains, it pours. And uh, there's a lot of things that are keeping me home right now. So please keep up with me watching the video. Uh, for the substitute, if there are opportunities for me to sort of uh, pause the video and ask the students to try it on their own, would you please also pause the video for me? Uh, let them try and then we'll get started right away. So you won't have to make such an extremely long video for us. Thank you. So um, today we are going into a new unit that is the Cartesian plane. So I think we should start with a very quick intro of why we have such an interesting name called the Cartesian plane uh, in the unit called Linear Relations. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is this guy named René Descartes. He is a not only philosopher, but also a scientist and a mathematician. So a long time ago, people a long time ago, if you were educated, you basically did everything. And if you were uneducated, you basically did nothing and you just were a lay person. And you just did manual labor. Um, this person, one of the first things that they, I guess, was coined by him, um, he applied the physical world or try to reason logically using math uh, with a lot of things in the physical world. And one of the things he used to do that was this thing called the Cartesian grid. Now this Cartesian grid or the Cartesian plane is essentially taking a 2D space and giving it order, giving it a system that we can use so that if I were to communicate using this system, to someone who doesn't speak English, they would still understand exactly what I am doing because we both understand the system. So the system is going to be um, essentially a long arrow and a long arrow going up, down, left, right. And it is divided into these little, I guess, squares. And every single intersection, every single piece or corner of these squares has a specific number assigned to them. Right. So think about it as if you go to a theater or if you go to if you've ever been to like a play, like a performing arts thing of, let's say, Hamilton or or Beauty and the Beast, Broadway, whatever, your seat is labeled. Even in the auditorium at Northern, if you go to the seats, you actually see rows labeled with alphabet letters. Right. Um, and this is sort of like the same system we use for normal you know everyday things like a uh, battleship we'll take a look if you see the only way you know how to you can play battleship is if you understand the system of reading a combo of one letter and one number if you don't know how to give a combo of a letter and a number you can't play this game in the same way if you don't know how to navigate using not a letter and a number but one number for the horizontal and one number for the vertical, you won't be able to use this system. So half of today's lesson is going to be used to learn this system and get really good at it. If you've seen this before, it'll be pretty easy. I'm gonna go through the logistics, the, the small details and the terms and the boring stuff, and then we will try using it. Okay, let's do it. So starting off, comments and pencil. The Cartesian coordinate system describes the location of a point, just as I said, every single point has a number assigned to it, using a x-axis that is a horizontal axis, and we call that the x-axis. Take a look. We label the horizontal x and also a vertical axis, which is the y-axis, right? We call it the y-axis. So uh, vertical, sorry. So please do not be confused if we are, or don't get it twisted, if we are talking about a number spanning from left to right, in other words, you know, a one here, a two there, a three there, a four there, a five there, a six there, whatever, or negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five. We're talking about the numbers on the horizontal side of things. We are talking about the x-axis, this arrow. This is the x-axis, x-line. All right. If we are referring to a number from the vertical line right there, that is referring to the y-axis. Okay. So a number that's talking about the up-down is the y-axis. 
because we have a number coming from the x-axis and a number coming from the y-axis, every single one of these points is going to be assigned a combo of two numbers. That is called an ordered pair or a coordinate. It's always in the form of horizontal first, so the x number first, followed by a comma, and then a y number next. Okay? And one more important thing, if you see that we span to the right in the positive numbers, if you span towards the left with negative numbers, we span up with positive numbers, and we span down with negative numbers, we all start from that center. And by default, that center is called the start, aka the origin of all the numbers. And it has the coordinate x value of 0 and a y value of 0. That's it. Sort of looks like a face. So remember that. This is the origin. Understand? I hope you do. Let's move on and start talking about how we can use the system. There we go. Once you're with me, please scroll down. Plot the following points on the grid above. Label each point. So we have a point called A, and it has the coordinate or the ordered pair 3, then 5. The 3 refers to the x axis, and the 5 refers to the y. How will we use that? Well, oh, this is a little messy, so let me erase that a little bit. And I think we can get rid of this highlighting. Okay, three, five. The x value of positive three is right here. And the y value of positive five is right there. You will take this area, okay, and that area, and where it connects together is where we have a point where x is a three, y is a five. So instead of writing it 3, 5 on the dot, we can actually label this as just A. You can, of course, write 3, 5 in there if you'd like, but it's going to be, it's going to get a little bit messy if you have more and more points. And if you already have A labeled down here, it's redundant. It's a waste of your time. That mathematicians are, let me see. Let's do one more. B. B has an x value of a negative 2, but the y value is still positive, a positive 4. If the x value is a negative 2, instead of moving right, we are moving left. 1, 2, negative 2. And then the y value of 4 means I'm moving up by 4. That's 1, 2, 3, 4. This point right here is my... Okay, this is negative 2, 1, ne positive 4. There you go. If the substitute could pause the video and give the students a chance, just a quick minute, to try and label all four of these based on x and y, that would be great. So let's pause the video. Okay. I'm assuming that you are playing this video again because you paused it ahead of time. Here we go. C, 4, negative 3. So I want you to be so comfortable with this in the future that you can go, okay, 4, negative 3, bam. Very quick. Okay, next. D, negative 1, negative 3, negative 1, negative 3, bam. That's D. E, 0, 6, 0, x, 6, up, bam. That's E. And F, 3, 0. X is a 3, Y is a 0. That means I'm dealing with that. I hope you can go that fast sometime very soon in the future. Once you have corrected or you have checked off that you got everything correct, uh, move on. If you didn't get something correct, because we're running out of time, we just quickly circle something that you might not have gotten right and keep moving along with us in the video. Cartesian practice. Right? This is sort of like a search and find. 
I hope you will get a chance to try this uh, once again uh, as a class. You can use people next to you just to confirm if you got it right together. If the substitute can give exactly five minutes for students to try number one, two, and three in class, that would be great. I'll give you an example. Which point is located at each ordered pair? The ordered pair says three, negative two. So I'm gonna look at my graph and find three as my X, negative two as my Y, it is the letter B. So I write B there. Next one, negative seven, negative eight. Well, negative seven is my X, do, 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 go left. Negative eight is my Y, and I go down. The letter in question is H, okay? Go ahead, pause the video. I hope that you will give yourself an honest chance in doing so. It shouldn't take more than five minutes. It shouldn't take more than four minutes, really. Give it a shot. Okay, if you're playing this video again, I'm hoping that it is because you did pause it and you are simply checking the answers. Let me write this all out for you. Okay, the letters are B, H, D, C, O, F. Write the order pair for each given point. E is negative three, negative two. G is seven, eight. M is, the hardest part is finding the letters. One, negative six. Q, negative eight, zero. P, eight, zero. And N, five, five. Hope these numbers match what you have in front of you. Plot the following points on the coordinate grid. Negative six, negative three, bam. Once again, I hope you get fast like this. Two, negative four, two, negative four, bam. And five, eight, five, eight. S, T, U. Okay. Once again, if the video is going a little fast, that's okay. You can always watch it at home or just put a little circle around it saying, I'm going to come back to this for homework right? because today's homework is very short, if not anything at all. Here we go. The next page is scatter plots. Why am I talking about scatter plots? Um, particularly in science, if you have done science, if you are doing science right now, you probably had an opportunity to go through the scientific method using graphs and understanding what it means to have a independent and dependent variable. We're going to talk about the most common type of graph you will have using a Cartesian coordinate, and that is a scatter plot in science. Okay, a scatter plot, let me zoom in. A scatter plot shows the relationship between two variables. In other words, something on the x-axis and something on the y-axis. Some kind of variable because it can change in number. Because, you know, if, if I'm talking about the price of, let's say, a handbag, the price can change. It is variable. Okay? And numbers sold. Of course, if you've ever been a cashier at a store or if you've ever dealt with business or money or anything like that, you would know that how much you sell is not the same every day. So that can also vary. For example, the scatter plot below shows the relationship between the price of popcorn and the number of bags sold. Does this pattern make sense? Remember, if we continue towards the right, that means the number is going up. And if we continue going upwards, the number is going up. Does it make sense that if the price goes up, the number sold is here? And if the price is down, the number of sold is here. Think about it. Going once, going twice. I think it does make sense because typically, you know, capitalism, right? Business 101. If you make something expensive, a lot less people are inclined to buy it. They're sort of turned off and they say, oh, what a ripoff. I'm never buying this again. Right? And the only people who buy it are the ones that really, really need it. But if the price is super cheap, just about everyone and their pet hamster is willing to pay the money to buy it. 
because it's a great deal. So it makes sense that the price is low, number of sold is high. It makes sense that the price is high, the number of sold is low. Okay, let's continue. So that's the magic of scatter plots. They tell a story. Here's an example. A group of 10 students recorded the number of hours they studied for a test and their test scores. In other words, hours they studied, the hours they studied is a variable and their test scores is a variable. Create a scatter plot to show the relationship between study hours and test scores. They already wrote down the variables for you. The study hours is going to be on the x-axis and the test score is going to be on the y-axis. Now, let me quickly mark down the scale. It's very important that you do. Each box is going to represent one unit. In this case, one unit means one hour. And on the top, every box, let's pretend the scale goes up by 10. Okay. And so uh, here, each box represents 10 units, whereas the unit is a single percent in your score. So I don't think you would go any higher than 100%. So I'm just going to stop right there. Let's do it. 380. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do this, but uh, if the substitute can pause the video and let students uh, give students a chance to use this as x, that as y, and use your Cartesian uh, coordinate system skills to graph this scatter plot correctly. Go ahead, pause the video, and let please give the students maybe about three to five minutes trying to do this. Three. Okay, if you're doing this correctly, um, I also need a title, uh, something that you will probably do in science for sure is, is have a title. So I'm going to say test scores versus hours studied. So usually the title of a, a graph, they usually, for whatever reason, like to give the y axis first, and then they compare it to how the x changes. So they like to put the x axis or the x variable uh, second in the title. Okay, and it's a fun fact. Anyways, there it is. Let's continue on. Very, very straightforward scatter plot. Do you think there's a pattern just for curiosity's sake? I would say so. This might be a bit of an outlier, okay? But if we didn't have that, if I pretend that wasn't there, take a look at all of this. It sort of looks like there is a relationship. The more hours you study, the higher your test score tends to be. Okay? So the magic of a scatter plot. Okay, let's move on. Going to the next page. Independent versus dependent variable. Now, this is the last piece of today's lesson, and that is why, uh, what makes something so special that it has to be on the X and what makes something so special that it has to be on the Y. Let me tell you an example of why something is, in fact, special. Mm, I think I need to quickly tell a story. Um... Is there a blank I can use? Oh, okay. Let's tell a story. Um, let's, let's pretend that Mr. Kim sells ice cream. Okay, that's my side hustle during the summer. There we go. And this is my graph. This is uh, temperature outside of the sun. And this is the amount of money made by Kim. Okay. And after my summer job selling ice cream, I discovered I, may ha I have a superpower. I discovered 
that if I make lots of money, it turns out I can make the sun hotter and hotter. Okay, so let's pretend this is 90 and it goes all the way to $100. If I earn $50, uh, right? If I make $50 in ice cream, I notice that the temperature will be set to about 25 degrees by the sun. But you know what's crazy? If I make $100, the sun will actually get hotter for me and turn into 35 degrees. And sometimes I can make $90 and it'll be like 28 degrees maybe. If I make $80, sometimes it will be you know 30 degrees. Sometimes I made $10 and when I made $10, the sun cooled down and it became closer to 15 degrees. Isn't that crazy? And after every single day that I measured how much money I made, I noticed that the sun's temperature would change. Like I'm actually like the X-Men. Okay, food for thought. What is wrong with my sentence? What is wrong with my suggestion? What's wrong with that idea? I'm hoping everyone believes that I, I, I'm delusional, that I am not a superhuman or I have a superpower, but instead I have something wrong. I think everyone here in their right mind can argue that I have my axes or my variables mixed up. It's actually the other way around. When the sun gets hot, because people get hot, they want to buy more ice cream. If the sun temperature is low, it's not that cold. Not too many people will want to buy the ice cream. And as time goes on every day, some days it's super hot, some days it's super cold, then it gets hot again, then it gets cold again, then it gets warm in the middle, then it gets hot again, and it gets, you get the point. The pattern is the same, but it's really important for us to figure out what is changing what. Is my money made changing the sun? Absolutely not. It's the sun that's changing how much money I make. So go back here. The key idea of independent versus dependent is this. Which one of the two variables is affecting which? So which one is the one that is changing what any way they want, they are independent. And which one is changing because the other one changed? So for example, the independent variable would be sun or so, uh, temperature. And the dependent variable would be because of the temperature, ice cream sold, right? Here's another interesting one. You could say independent variable is number of Big Macs I eat. And the dependent variable will be my weight. Okay, there's a lot of different ways we can go about comparing two variables, but you must be clear which one is independent and which one is dependent? The independent is always written on the horizontal and the dependent is always on the vertical. Now, this is more of a science lesson, but science is, as I said, it's sort of like the, the firstborn of mathematics. And so they are going to be large overlaps between the two. Let's take a look at this practice and the rest of class, you can finish questions two, three, and, and four. Okay. Uh, let's do it. Or maybe I'll do number one and I'll do number four. Okay. Uh, uh, Xavier and Eliana are going hiking and are trying to figure out how much water to bring with them on the hike. The amount of water they should bring depends on how long they plan to hike. So just from that English, here are two variables. Which one depends on what? And which one, therefore, is the dependent? Which one is the independent? Let W represent the amount of water they should bring. Let T represent the length of hike in, excuse me, in hours. Since the amount of water depends on the time, the time is independent 
and the water depends on the independent. Okay, again, it, it's not supposed to be rocket science, but some people do get confused. Independent would be the time, and the dependent would be the amount of water. Please try number two and number three in your own time. We're going to scroll down to number four, where this time we're doing it in reverse. Instead of giving you a word situation, we are looking at a graph. Consider this scatter plot of the number of toppings versus the cost of a pizza. What are the independent and dependent variables? The independent is toppings because automatically it is on the horizontal axis. Okay, it's on the x-axis. And the dependent is the cost of pizza. Is there a relationship between the two? What am I asking? I am asking if, does it seem to follow a general arrow direction? And I'm gonna say, yes, it does. If the dots were like this, if the dots were like all over the place, and it doesn't seem to be any pattern, and the best arrow I can draw is like this, right? There is no pattern at all. Then you would say, no, doesn't seem like there is. But here, it does follow a general direction. All of those dots are. And so we say, yes, as, sorry, uh, yes. And I'm going to use a very specific word. There is a positive correlation Positive, what does that mean? As one increases, the other increases. So how about I write this? As, that's really small, give me a second. As the number of toppings increase, the cost also increases. So science, you know, maybe we should do it like science. Science is usually if and then. If the number of toppings increase, then the cost of pizza increases. If the number of toppings increases, then the cost of pizza increases. If and then is very important in math, in uh, science, I think, in grade nine here in Northern. So there you go. Okay, please spend the rest of time, uh, rest of the class time completing the questions we have not yet done. If you, the video itself was too fast, would you please go visit it again during the weekend? And if you're able to finish these questions we haven't done or anything else that we might have missed along the way, then you're good for this weekend. Okay, good job completing chapter three. I hope the test was okay. And um, yeah. We'll see you soon. Bye.